We're talking football and a little hockey with Dave Campbell of uh, 630 Ched in Edmonton. Good morning, Dave. How are you? How's Edmonton? Hey, doing good, uh, Darren. We're, uh, it's a cloudy day. I think it stopped raining. It's been raining here for the last few days. Uh, the sunshine is coming soon. So uh, it's, and it's football and hockey weather. Let's just put it that way. Is it ever? I mean, you guys are pushing towards uh, your first preseason game. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders are there on Saturday. How's camp been so far for the Elks? Yeah, I think it's been a, a very fast camp, very competitive. Uh, you see the leadership just jump off the page with McLeod Bethel Thompson. I think everyone notices including the defensive side. And I think that's a, a very good sign. You know, they're, they're 11 days in the camp now, and they're still, uh, you know, about 72 hours away from playing their first preseason game against the Riders. And I, I think they need that because we're at the point in camp where they are darn right sick of each other. Uh, so it's it's been good. I You know, I think the coaching staff has been pleased so far, but, you know, I think it'll be good to have, you know, another, you know, another team, that this uh, that the Elks are able to play against and to get a true evaluation, right? You get to see who, you know, who yeah. dials it up in practice but doesn't dial it up in a game, or or the opposite. Some some players may not practice well, but they're going to show up when the lights are on on Saturday here at Commonwealth. You know, Rod used to talk about that when he was the voice of the Riders, the uh, the training camp award, right? Uh, the guy everybody's drooling over in training camp does nothing. You never hear from him again in the regular season. But you mentioned Macbeth. Uh, I love that, you know, that's going so well. Um, I, I've been a big fan of his. Um, he's been on this show. Um, but that's always been a, a point of conversation around the league is Trey Ford, McLeod Bethel-Thompson, Trey Ford, McLeod Bethel-Thompson. So how's the whole situation playing out in camp? Yeah, you know, I think we, let's just touch on that is the relationship between McLeod and, and Trey. And you know, when McLeod was signed back in early January, you know, obviously Trey Ford did not take that very well at the time because going out of uh, the season, and remember the Elks had the, uh, you know, their last game was at the third week in October, and then they had the bye week in week 21, so they are all wrapped up uh, for their season. And Chris Jones in the final media availability said, Trey Ford will go into training camp as our number one. Well, you know, as they often do, things change, especially when you're a team that has only won eight games under Chris Jones in the last two seasons. So when McLeod was signed, Trey didn't take it very well, but McLeod got on the phone right away and started the communication and building the relationship with Trey. And those two talk constantly. And in camp, you can kind of tell, you you can't kind of, you can really tell that those two have a really good thing going right now. Trey's accepted what is going on. And I, I think Trey for, you know, for, for what he did last year in those 10 games. And I think some were really good, some were just okay, and some were not good. You know, he needs to take a step back and learn from a veteran who's won before, who has been behind, you know, quality quarterbacks, you know, in his own right in, in Ricky Ray, and then help win a great cup in 22. I think it's a good thing for Trey Ford. McLeod, is this a one-year thing, a two-year thing? I don't know. I mean, it's clear as mud right now beyond this season, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's 24. This team has to start winning games and has to start making a run towards a playoff spot. And I think McLeod has come in and has shown leadership, has shown the preparation uh, needed. Has uh, he's always he's talking to everybody on this on this offense. He's talking to the coaches. He's talking to Jerry Jackson, the offensive coordinator, his O line, his running backs, his receivers. Um, and I think he's really really impressed. We're talking to Dave Campbell, 630 Chet in Edmonton, Elks analyst. And, uh, um, you know, question coming in here from the audience. I don't know if, if you'll have an answer to this, um, but we'll ask it anyways. BW in Edmonton watching right now on YouTube says, Dave, are they looking at opening the upper bowl again at some time during the season in Edmonton? Do you know anything about that? Well, the plan is to close the upper bowl unless they need to open up the upper bowl. So, you know, capacity is going to be around 31,000 with the, with the lower bowl. If they feel that they need to open the upper deck, and they hope to do this, you know, on more than one occasion, obviously. Uh, but if, they, if ticket sales are starting to push that number past that 31, 32,000 mark, then they're going to open up sections uh, again in the upper bowl. So, but a full opening? No, that's not happening for for this season or you know ever yeah. again. Let's let 
That's possible. <laughs> and <too>. that makes <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, no doubt, for sure. Okay, um, we got to talk about Antonio Alfano, and I hope I'm saying that right. But yep, you, you know, are. this is this is the story coming out of the CFL supplemental draft. We look at, and, and sometimes we want to block out all the negative and and look at the positive because I mean upside. Five-star recruit, one of the top, you know, high yep. school prospects, Alabama. Now it didn't work out in Alabama. It didn't work out in Colorado. It didn't work out a lot of places. But what do we know about this young man uh, coming to the uh, Edmonton Elks, and how excited should we be? Yeah, so we should explain what the supplemental draft is for for just people that don't know. It's for those that were late in declaring for the CFL draft. Okay, so this happened a couple of years ago. We had uh, Jamin Pelly who uh, declared yeah. and the Elks picked him. I believe they surrendered a second round pick for that. And TJ Ram, uh, which was selected by the Calgary Stampeders. Uh, so this year it was Antonio Alfano and you mentioned it, uh, mom born in Toronto. So that qualifies him for the draft. And how it works in the supplemental draft is it's basically a bid process. So it's it's whatever draft pick that you're, you know, you're willing to surrender. No other team made a claim. So it was just an eighth round pick. I mean, there was talk that if he was in the draft in 24, he would be a first potential first rounder. So 6'4", 285. The thing with Alfano, he hasn't played very much, you know, and five-star recruit, that jumps off the page for sure. Uh, when Nick Saban says you quit on the team, everyone's going to, you know, have their eyes perk up and, uh, every, you know, their eyebrows go, huh, and all that stuff. And, you know, I think they know that there was, you know, that – bit of controversy with him and we know his dad said look he i think he was away for his ailing grandmother so i don't know and then he goes to colorado and he never plays as well and uh and then it's lackawanna college and you know it, that's division two ncaa but you know I, I think for the elks they look at a you know they look at a player who's 6'4 285 and you know their interior line isn't set in stone as far as their canadian content is concerned because i think a canadian is going to start there um is it jamin pelly i think they like jamin uh, he didn't have the best season last year of course you know he had a lot of you know there's a personal tragedy in his life as well he got hurt quite a bit he removed himself from about a couple games or three games got hurt uh on a number of you know number, too many times let's just say that when he's good he's good when he's not it's 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 you know especially when he's not healthy he just you know he doesn't help the team so I think they would like to see him play more, but they don't know if, you know, they don't know if he's, well, for one, is he playing too heavy? Does he, does he need to cut some weight here to be a, more of an every down player? So uh, they have Sam Achenpong, who's, you know, okay. I don't know if he's overly impactful down to down. So if Alfano can come in as a Canadian with those me measurables, I mean, the upside's there. I mean, you can't ignore that. The character side of the things, you know, there's a bit of a concern there. And, all I'll say is this, is you hope that they have done their proper vetting and they're going to bring someone with good character and that, you know, things just happen and sometimes they do. Even if they haven't, um, I don't know that there's much risk here. And, you know, Chris Jones, mm -hmm. if there's ever somebody who likes to take a risk and, you know, try different things to see what fits, bring different guys in. I mean, he brought Vince Young into the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, right? Um this kind of falls under that, and it reminds me, and I wanted to pull up his name, of the uh, the Detroit Red Wings scout, um, Hawken Anderson. He was the scout who drafted uh, Pavel Datsuk and Henrik Zetterberg, the European scout for the, for the Detroit Red Wings. And his philosophy was, I can find a third-line penalty-killing winger. I can find a fourth-line winger in free agency for a certain price tag. They're out there. We can find one. Plug and play. Not going to create a, an incredible impact on the team, but will fit a role. When I'm drafting in the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth rounds of the draft, I'm looking for the most upside I can possibly find. And so you look mm -hmm. at skill nine times out of, well, 95 times out of 100, it's not going to pan out, but you're looking for the five out of 100. You're looking for the Datsuk, the Zetterberg. And, you know, this may not pan out. It's an eighth round pick in the Canadian Football League draft that you're giving up. But if it does pan out, the upside could be incredible to have that type of an athlete Canadian as well. It could be incredible. And the Elks were prepared to, to, to give up a first rounder for next year. 
if, if that's what it came down to. Just no one else bid for Alfano, so they didn't have to. So they're gonna yeah. they're just gonna toss an eighth and an eighth in there. So you're right. And you know, it's a CFL draft, right? And you tell me the difference between a first round pick or first overall pick and a middle second round pick or a you know fourth round pick. It's hard to tell, right? And you know, this year the Elks picked Joe DeBlanco and you know, as uh, Dwayne Ford likes to say out of TSN, you got to find the unicorn in the draft, right? And I think Alfano might have been that unicorn as well, but uh, definitely would have made that first round more intriguing or even second round. So, yeah, I mean, it's value, yeah. right? And every every team values a certain athlete in a different way. And Chris Jones, he looks at a, a 6'4", 285, who can be a Canadian. Uh, that's that's a gift. And uh, if if it can pan out, Chris Jones will look like a genius. And if it doesn't, well, it's just another player that didn't work out. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Look, we got to get out of here right away. We're up against it. But how's Edmonton uh, on a day off ahead of the Western Conference final? They'll open with Dallas tomorrow. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. And, you know, it, it's weird because it's been, what, 21 years since these two teams have met in the in the postseason. And there's a lot of, you know, Oilers fans that don't really remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been that long. Uh, but, you know, I think the Stars are going to be favored. They should be favored. But I think, you know, the Oilers, the way they played game six and seven with that maturity and patience, I think that's a factor in this series. You know, and they're going to have to be careful with uh, how they play in their own zone and their defensive style. But I think they showed that, you know, if they have to, they, they can be patient and and uh, suppress shots. The goaltending has to be better with, with Skinner, who came in game six, seven, and you know, did his job. He didn't face a lot of shots, but he did his job. That's going to change because the Stars can really push the pace. And when you have the goal scoring and the depth that they have, they have a good goalie. It's going to be interesting. But, you know, some people might say this would be a five-game series. I don't know. Uh, I think the Oilers are better than they were two years ago against the Avalanche when they got swept in the West Western Conference Final. Um, will the Oilers win this series? It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but I do think they got a puncher's chance here. Um, and they may get Adam Henrique back for game one tomorrow. We'll see. Uh, Evander Kane didn't skate, but that's more commonplace in the playoffs. He, he doesn't really skate in practice. Uh, they're confident. They're ready to go, and uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow night, game one. It will be fun. Enjoy it, and enjoy uh, getting back into the preseason swing of things on the weekend, Dave. Thanks, Darren. Can't wait. You know, you can only watch your own team practice against each other for so long before it kind of gets gets a little draggy <laughs> yeah gets a little stale Let's dave go. campbell 6 30 ched listen to them on uh, the broadcast and actually their coverage should their uh their call should be what we all listen to and when we watch cfl plus for the 